invitation to speak at this meeting. Uh, I won't have a lot of detail on the evidence base for the claims and, and summary that I'll mention in this talk, but there is a 10,000 word paper for those who are hungry for the detail, which is I can send to you if you're interested, was published in the journal Addiction earlier this year. So what I'm aiming to do is to give you a broad brush picture of what we know about the adverse health effects of cannabis and, and what remains uh, in debate and uncertain. Oops. Well, the first thing to talk about is how do we decide that cannabis is a cause of various adverse health outcomes? Uh, the sort of criteria that are used are fairly standard ones. We require evidence that cannabis use is associated with the adverse health outcomes that we're interested in. Uh, we are able to say which comes first, the cannabis use or the adverse outcome. Uh, so which is cause and which is effect. And we look for, ideally, evidence in longitudinal studies, that is studies where people have been followed over time uh, to enable us to distinguish the effects of cannabis use from the effects of other drug use, because as we'll see, people who are uh, regular cannabis users especially are also likely to be uh, cigarette smokers, consume alcohol, and are much more likely to use a variety of other illicit drugs. The other complication in sorting out adverse health effects of cannabis is that the people who get involved in regular cannabis use are not a random sample of the population. And that is, they differ in particular ways that put them at risk of various adverse health effects. So one of the challenges in this field is sorting out what's an effect of the drug from what are pre-existing risks that uh, these individuals might carry because of their behaviour, uh, cognitive ability, for example, and social and psychosocial background. I'll also uh, do some comparative assessments. That is, how does the evidence on the adverse health effects of cannabis compare with comparable evidence that we might have on the adverse health effects of tobacco, alcohol, opiates, and, and other illicit drugs? If we look at the acute adverse health effects, and what I mean by this is the effects that you might experience if you use the drug once or twice or, or fairly infrequently. And it's been well known for a long time that cannabis is a drug of low toxicity. That is, particularly, it's uh, very difficult, if uh, at all possible, to overdose on cannabis, whereas people can die from opiate overdoses, as we've heard about earlier in this, this meeting. They can also die from overdoses of stimulant drugs like cocaine and methamphetamine. We don't see uh, fatal overdoses from, from cannabis in that, uh, in that sense. But people can have unpleasant experiences, uh, and it, it's not uncommon for individuals to be made very anxious by the effects of, uh, of uh, cannabis, particularly the uh, tetrahydrocannabinol, THC, the active psychoactive component of it. People can get very panicky. They can become uh, concerned and paranoid, and people are out following them. Uh, and these sorts of symptoms often prompt people to seek medical care because they're worried uh, about the, the effects the drug is having on them especially common amongst naive users, but not, that is, people who haven't used the drug before. But it's not uh, confined to uh, novice users. Uh, experienced users can exp uh, have these sorts of effects if they get much, much larger doses than they're accustomed to using. There's no question that it impairs cognitive and psychomotor performance. People's ability to remember and attend to things is impaired when they're intoxicated by the drug and their motor skills, their capacity to control, say, a motor vehicle, for example, is impaired. And as we'll see, that's a relevant concern when we come to looking at the possible impact of this drug on uh, accident risks. I think there's reasonable evidence now from laboratory studies and, and case reports that people can develop psychotic symptoms, that is, they can begin to hear voices, hallucinate and see things that are not there, and become a very concerned and anxious uh, at very high doses. Uh, what seems to have changed in, in recent years is that these adverse effects may be becoming more common because people are using much more potent uh, forms of cannabis product that are in the market, particularly in places like the US where there's a de facto legalisation of uh, cannabis in some states with very liberal medical marijuana laws. And in fact, four states have legalised the retail sale of cannabis. And in those jurisdictions, very potent cannabis uh, products are being prepared and there's also increased concern that some of these products have much, much higher rates or higher concentrations of tetrahydrocannabinol and lower concentrations of another cannabinoid, uh, cannabidiol, which appears to moderate or, or uh, lessen the adverse effects of THC. We'll come back to that later. <coughs> 
From the point of view of uh, non-users, the major risk that cannabis use poses is that people might uh, drive a car, for example, while intoxicated and cause accidents that damage themselves and other parties who are non-users. And so we've known, as I mentioned earlier, that there's dose-related impaired performance on a wide range of uh, psychomotor tasks that are relevant to driving a car. So one would expect that if people are intoxicated, they're much uh, less likely to perform well if, if they're driving. There's now a, a, a sort of building evidence from epidemiological studies where people have looked at the presence of uh, THC in the blood of people killed and injured in accidents uh, and a variety of other studies, which point fairly strongly to the fact that people who do drive after, uh, shortly after using this drug do increase their risk of uh, accident. Uh, and this is independently of the, whether they also have used alcohol. And meta-analyses, that is studies looking across these studies, combining the results, have, have estimated that roughly the risk of an accident is roughly doubled in people who drive while intoxicated with cannabis. Uh, and that risk goes up if they're also drinking alcohol, as a substantial minority of uh, cannabis users do. Now, in terms of the contribution that cannabis use might make to motor vehicle accidents uh, as on the whole, it's a much more modest contribution that alcohol makes, particularly in countries like, well, the European countries in North America and Australia and New Zealand. An estimate, for example, in France in the early 2000s was that cannabis might have been responsible for a bit under 3% of motor vehicle accident fatalities in that country, uh, whereas alcohol accounted for about 28%. So it's still a long way behind alcohol, but it's a, an avoidable risk that we should encourage users not to take and many states have uh, introduced uh, roadside drug testing in an, an attempt to discourage people from driving while intoxicated. The uh, health effects of uh, larger concern, I think, are ones uh, the adverse effects of chronic use. And by this I mean the daily, especially the daily or near daily use of cannabis uh, over months uh, and very often periods of years. Uh, especially if people begin uh, using in their mid-teens, which is becoming an increasingly common pattern in many developed countries, particularly North American parts of Europe and Australia, and to a lesser extent uh, a problem emerging in many uh, other, other economies which have not traditionally had uh, cannabis uh, as a, a drug of uh, use amongst young people. So young people who start in their mid-teens and continue to use uh, in a daily or near daily way into their late 20s are putting themselves at, uh, at risk of uh, developing a series of adverse consequences, and I'll focus on uh, some of these here, uh, the ones listed, and go through the evidence on each of those uh, uh, very briefly. Beginning with uh, cannabis use disorders or cannabis dependence, uh, the best evidence here again comes from countries like the US, uh, Australia, and parts of Europe which indicate that cannabis use disorders, that is people who find it difficult to control their use, difficult to cease using, uh, and who uh, are using and continuing to use regularly in the face of problems that their drug use is causing, uh, that this is the most common form of illicit uh, drug dependence in many developed countries. And it's still nowhere near as common as alcohol use disorders, but uh, it, it is becoming a, a common problem. And what's happened over the last decade or so in countries like Australia, um, most parts of the EU, the US and the Netherlands, is that people presenting to uh, drug treatment services uh, with cannabis use disorders, the number of those has gone up. And in countries like Australia and the Netherlands, people with cannabis use disorders are the, almost as common as people with alcohol use disorders in presenting to treatment services. And for many of these people, they do report withdrawal symptoms. For a long time, there was scepticism about whether there was such a thing as cannabis dependence because people doubted that there was a withdrawal syndrome. I don't think there's any doubt that there is in very heavy users. And uh, it can be treated. There are treatments for cannabis dependence, such as CBT, uh, that we've just heard about. But uh, a lot of people still find it difficult to achieve enduring abstinence from this particular drug, and a lot of the outcomes of treatment for cannabis dependence resemble those uh, outcomes for alcohol dependence. It looks a lot like alcohol dependence does. So what are the risks and consequences? That is, what are, what are the chances that someone developing the cannabis use disorder if they ever use cannabis? Uh, 
We don't have lots of good estimates of that, but the ones produced in the US in the early 1990s and more recent ones that, uh, in the US in the last uh, five to 10 years suggest a, a bit under one in 10 people who ever use this drug will develop a pattern of dependence that is near daily use and difficulty controlling it. If they also uh, initiate when they're adolescents, that is in their mid-teens, that risk goes up fairly substantially, more like one in six. And if people ever get involved in a pattern of, of daily use, uh, the estimate somewhere between a third and a half of, of daily users will develop dependence and, uh, and, and disorders. Now, it is true that the sorts of health consequences that cannabis use disorder, people with cannabis use disorders report are a lot less severe than comparable uh, health problems in people with serious alcohol dependence or opiate dependence or cocaine and stimulant dependence. Uh, the most common of these being respiratory symptoms like coughs and colds and impaired memory and cognitive performance and often impaired work performance. People are not doing as well as they would like at, at work. And they often uh, experience strong social disapproval from people around them because they're chronically intoxicated and not doing much else except uh, obtaining and uh, smoking cannabis. And when the drug is illegal and as expensive as it often is, that can be a fairly a substantial economic consequence for family budgets. A long-standing contentious issue in, in the literature on cannabis is whether cannabis is a gateway drug, meaning does the use of cannabis increase the likelihood that young people will go on to use more serious uh, or more hazardous and harmful forms of illicit drugs like heroin, cocaine and so on. Now, try and separate what we know, what, are, what the facts are here from what people argue about. There's no question that there's a typical sequence of involvement that's been observed in, in the US and other developed countries that young people who start to use alcohol and tobacco at an early age are much more likely to become cannabis users and those who become cannabis users are much more likely uh, to go on to use other forms of drugs, of other illicit drugs. But it's not just cannabis use per se, there's, it's regular cannabis use that seems to be the most predictive of the likelihood of young people going on to use other drugs. So a young person who begins in their mid-teens becomes a, a, a daily or a more, more frequently than weekly user is much, much more likely to become a, a user of other illicit drugs. Now, what are the explanations of that pattern of involvement? Is there something about cannabis that makes people more likely to want to use other illicit drugs? Well, the competing hypothesis is, is common causes. Is there something about individuals who like to start to use cannabis early that means they're already at higher risk of using other illicit drugs independently of having used cannabis? And that could be for a variety of reasons. It could be a shared genetic vulnerability. There's common genetic contributions to the risks of dependence on alcohol, tobacco, cannabis, other, other illicit drugs. Or it could be uh, a sort of sociological and, and social factors that young people who get involved in regular cannabis users, use are much more likely to affiliate with other peers who are doing the same thing. They're much more likely to get involved in uh, dealing uh, cannabis to their peers to fund their own drug use and this increases their opportunity to purchase and use uh, illicit drugs. Uh, the longitudinal studies, I think, are, are certainly pointing towards there being these sorts of common uh, sociological and, and genetic vulnerabilities. But the, then there's also suggestive animal evidence that is in animal studies where you can expose animals to large quantities of uh, THC. There's suggestive evidence that early exposure to various drugs primes animals' brains in ways that make them more inclined to find the effects of other drugs rewarding. So this, this hypothesis is still a matter for debate. Uh, I just want to set out what, what the major uh, arguments are there. The other big concern that many people express is the effect that cannabis use, particularly regular cannabis use by young people in their teens, might have on their life chances because of its effects on their performance in schools. And we know that uh, poor, poor, poor school performance and early school dropout are much more common in young people who are regular cannabis users. The debate has been about uh, which is cause and which is effect. Because we also know from the longitudinal studies when people have been followed, particularly in New Zealand, that young people who are having difficulty at school are much, much more likely to get involved in regular cannabis use. So teasing out the effects of 
the characteristics of individuals who get involved in regular use from the effects of regular use on educational performance has been the challenge in this particular area. I think the, the evidence is, is strengthening that it does contribute, cannabis does contribute to poor school performance. Uh, it probably has a, uh, some sort of small uh, direct effect in because the associations between regular cannabis use and early school failure does persist after you take account of the uh, differences between young people who do and don't use cannabis. And it's not rocket science to believe that if you're a young person who's struggling with schoolwork, then smoking cannabis every day is not going to improve things. It's much more likely to make things worse. And I think that's what we're seeing in this. But it's young people who are at risk of school failure who are especially likely to get involved in this pattern of use that increases their likelihood of failing and leaving school early, which has predictable consequences for their chances of employment and, and quality uh, of life later on. An obvious mechanism through which cannabis might impair school performance might be impo Im impairing cognitive uh, ability. Now, there's lots of case control studies, meaning that studies which compare young people who are heavy cannabis users with young people who haven't used cannabis uh, on various measures of cognitive uh, performance. And it's been generally found that young, heavy cannabis users tend to perform more poorly on a range of cognitive tasks than do their peers who haven't used cannabis fairly heavily. And I stress the heavily because we're typically talking here again about young people who are daily or near daily users of the drug. There's support for this from neuroimaging studies where, where people have done functional and structural uh, 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 magnetic uh, resonance imaging of brains of young people, which is suggesting that there may well be structural and functional changes in various brain uh, structures uh, that are implicated in uh, memory and performance. More recently, the uh, Dunedin cohort, that is a, a very large birth cohort of young New Zealanders followed from birth through to their early 30s, found that in that cohort, young people who initiated cannabis in their mid-teens, who'd continued to smoke daily through their 20s into their 30s, had uh, an average eight-point uh, lower IQ than their peers who'd not either not smoke cannabis or if they'd smoke cannabis had discontinued uh, much earlier. And there's a, a US study in publication in the uh, JAMA, Journal of the American Medical Association Internal Medicine, which shortly appear uh, in a, an American cohort largely replicating the finding of the New Zealand study suggesting that daily smoking of cannabis over periods of decades is not good for one's memory or cognitive ability. What's uncertain about these sorts of cognitive effects is the extent to which they can be reversed if people stop using cannabis and, and become and remain abstinent. And what people debate about is what, the, the, what plausible mechanisms there might be uh, for these sorts of effects. Cannabis and schizophrenia. Uh, this is a, another hot topic um, and a debate in the area. And probably the best evidence is from Swedish cohort where 50,000 young Swedish men were followed from the age of 18 for 27 years uh, into their 40s through psychiatric case registers. They had been asked about their cannabis use at age 18 and what they found was that there was a, a dose-response rela dose relationship. The more often someone had used cannabis at age 18, the higher the risk of them receiving a diagnosis of schizophrenia over the subsequent follow-up period. There's broad support for that finding from other birth cohort studies uh, in New Zealand, uh, a Dutch study and, and a German cohort. These are not reporting schizophrenia per se, but look reporting uh, a likelihood of, of psychotic symptoms. There's also biological plausibility for uh, regular cannabis use producing uh, this sort of disorder in that if you give uh, young people normal young people and people with schizophrenia uh, doses of tetrahydrocannabinol, you do produce uh, symptoms of uh, psychosis. Um, so it's, it's a plausible hypothesis that, that it, it's a contributory cause. By that we're meaning it's rough, daily cannabis use roughly doubles the risk of developing this particular disorder uh, and probably most likely in people who have pre-existing vulnerability to the illness. There's also evidence at this stage more often associations between regular cannabis use, depression and suicide in young people. Uh, so we've got the first condition for causal inference met in that the, there is an association between regular cannabis use and these outcomes. 
What's less certain is whether these studies have properly controlled for confounding, that is, for differences between non -cannabis, uh, cannabis users and non-cannabis users in their likelihood of developing these illnesses. And the other uh, challenge is deciding whether depression, uh, whether cannabis use might be a, f a symptom of depression of people smoking cannabis to uh, ameliorate or reduce the, the sort of uh, symptoms of, of their depression. There are also associations between cannabis use and other mental disorders, and Vim Van and Brink also talked yesterday about attention deficit uh, hyperactivity disorder and drug use disorders. But again, for most cases, these are showing associations. We're not really clear at the moment whether cannabis has a causal role in these disorders. But it probably does not improve the outcome. So people who have these illnesses who are regular cannabis users, we should be attending to screening and, and attempting to intervene with them. The much less certain thing about cannabis is the adverse health effects chronic use. That is, what might be the consequences for people's cardiovascular health, for their risks of cancer and other things if they smoke cannabis daily over decades, like people tend to smoke cigarettes over decades or heavy drinkers drink alcohol over decades. The area of regular cannabis use in pregnancy, I think, is, is an area that's important that's uh, been a bit eclipsed in recent literature uh, because of the young, young women are using this drug at a point where they may well become pregnant with or without the plan to do so. There's certainly suggestion from the older literature of poorer birth outcomes, certainly lower birth weight and uh, more complications during birth and prematurity. Uh, the complication here is that young women who get involved in regular cannabis use are probably at higher risk of these sorts of events for a variety of other reasons, e.g. poorer diet, lack of access to uh, antenatal care, and, and more often than not they're also using smoking tobacco and using alcohol and other drugs. But it's certainly a topic that needs more attention and uh, young women need to be uh, discouraged from using cannabis uh, if they're uh, pregnant or thinking about uh, becoming pregnant. Respiratory risks of cannabis have been a long-standing concern for obvious reasons, given that there's very strong similarities between the constituents of cannabis and tobacco smoke. And it's been well known for over 30 years that very heavy cannabis smokers report much more symptoms of chronic bronchitis. And there's been older literature reporting pathological changes in the lung of marijuana and especially tobacco smokers and impaired immunological responses in the lungs of regular cannabis smokers. So certainly it's not good for respiratory health. What's been less clear is whether regular smoking produces chronic obstructive uh, pulmonary disease or emphysema uh, in the same way that tobacco smoke does, uh, smoking does. Um, the evidence is it is at best conflicting. There's a small number of studies which suggest that it does impair respiratory function, but uh, recent uh, long-term studies of regular cannabis smokers suggest that uh, have not failed, uh, failed to find clear evidence of uh, emphysema and uh, obstructive uh, pulmonary disease. Uh, the other complication here is there's been the move away from smoking towards vaporizers and it's, it's unclear to what extent uh, vaporizing cannabis reduces these respiratory risks or not. Respiratory cancers have also been a concern for an understandable reason. Uh, the evidence here is, is very conflicting, mixed findings from case control studies, some suggesting an increased risk of cancers of the upper respiratory tract in heavy cannabis smokers, other studies not finding it, and the complication being that it's very hard to find somebody who's only smoked cannabis. Most cannabis smokers have also been and often are tobacco smokers, so it's, it's been difficult to disentangle any uh, respiratory risk here. So the, the uncertainty here is how convincing is the absence of this evidence? Uh, is the absence of evidence evidence that we don't have, this isn't a risk or not? I think it's far too early to say because we really haven't had enough people smoking cannabis daily over decades to be able to assess this, this particular risk. I think, th whoops, I think I skipped. There are a variety of other cancers that have been reported uh, occurring at higher risk. Uh, in cannabis uh, users, uh, childhood cancers occurring in women who smoked, uh, children born to women who smoked during pregnancy, uh, 
Uh, none of those have really been replicated. Uh, they're, they're, they're likely to be chance findings because they turned up from analyses that were sort of looking at large numbers of possible uh, risk factors. Uh, there's a single study uh, suggesting increased risk of prostate cancer in men who smoke. Uh, the more interesting one is a very recent development. There's been three case control studies uh, of cannabis use in testicular cancer uh, where there has been some replication. It's not wholly implausible that this could be a risk because we know that there are receptors for uh, cannabinoids in the testes. So this is uh, a finding that's interesting and deserves to be followed up uh, and explored further. I think one of the, the more interesting emerging health risks is cardiovascular disease. We've known for a long time that tetrahydrocannabinol or THC is a very potent stimulant, st stimulant the, the cardiovascular system. It, it increases heart rate and uh, blood pressure. Generally, users develop tolerance to these effects, particularly if they're young and healthy. But there, there have been concerns about the risks of cannabis smoking in, say, middle-aged adults whose risk baseline risk of cardiovascular disease are, are already much higher because of their age and whose use tends to be much more intermittent. And more recently, particularly from France, there's been in increased numbers of case reports of myocardial infarctions or, or heart attacks and strokes in young cannabis users who have been particularly heavy smokers. Uh, and there's, this is an, an area that it does require much more attention, particularly if people are smoking more, recent, uh, more heavily, using more potent products, and may well be using for longer periods. So the cardiovascular risks may well prove to be, be more significant in the longer term than perhaps the cancer risks. The other question that's always asked is we've had evidence, most particularly from the US and more recently from Europe, that the average THC content of the sorts of cannabis products that are used by cannabis users in these countries has gone up fairly substantially. Um, and there's also been, as I mentioned earlier, uh, accompanied, this has been accompanied by a decline in cannabidiol, or CBD. It's uncertain at the, at the extent to which users take account of the increased potency, that is, do people use less of these more potent products than the older, less potent products. The evidence that's available suggests that they don't, they can titrate, meaning that they can adjust their dose, but they're not, not able to do it very well. That is, they tend to overshoot and use much more than they intended to, which is one of the reasons why we're seeing more people turning up in emergency rooms uh, for cannabis-related problems in the US. So just finished by mentioning who the, the high risk groups are for some of these adverse effects that we've talked about. The clearest of these is adolescents, young people who initiate early, particularly around the age of 15 seems to be critical, are much more likely to get involved in regular use, much more likely therefore to develop problems related to school performance, more likely uh, to get involved in other drug use and conduct disorders. So there are abundant reasons why we'd want to discourage cannabis use by young people and, and certainly the literature points strongly in that direction. Pregnant women and women planning pregnancy, we certainly should be getting advice out about the desirability of avoiding smoking cannabis. And people with pre-existing conditions that might put them at increased risk, uh, especially cardiovascular disease in older adults, uh, respiratory disease, uh, and people with psychoses and common mental disorders, and people who are using alcohol and other types of drugs are especially likely to develop dependence on this, this drug. So thanks very much for your attention.